It is my great privilege to welcome to Talk Nation Radio this week, Rob Call, who is an award-winning journalist, inventor, software architect, connector, and visionary. He is the author of The Bottom-Up Revolution, Mastering the Emerging World of Connectivity. He has pioneered first-of-their-kind conferences in positive psychology, brain science, and story. He hosts some of the world's smartest, most interesting, and powerful people on his bottom-up radio show, and Rob founded and publishes the progressive news and opinion site opednews.com, which has seen over 23 million visitors. Rob, welcome back to Talk Nation Radio. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, so let's talk about connection and disconnection. What does that mean in the context of your work? Well, the great thing is that the internet has enabled people to connect in new and different ways. The, the, the sad thing is that people are becoming screen addicted, and so they're disconnecting from the old ways that they were connected, which is face-to-face. -face. And it's really important that they realize that and get out off of that addiction, and it is an addiction, and it starts very young, especially when you're looking at little kids who are given uh, iPads and things like that to distract them or babysit them. And so we really need to fix that. And part of what I do in my book is I have a chapter that, that goes into how to be a better connector, how to connect with people better, how to connect face to face better. And uh, it's a skill and people can get better at it. Which, which one are we doing? I'm looking at your face. You're a real person, but this is the internet. Which, which one are we up to here? Well, this is, face is better, but even better is, is where you can actually touch them, smell them, and, and be directly in contact with them. I mean, that's the best. That's, that's the gold standard. And it, it is part of who we are. We evolved to be connected to other people. And we have literally hundreds of genes that are all tied into that connection, that part of us being tied to each other. Well, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to disagree. I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, just to play devil's advocate, I'm, I'm trying to organize people around the world uh, for peace and against war. Uh, and a lot of smart people tell me just about the very worst thing I can do for the planet is get on an airplane. So how do I see them and touch them and smell them? Well, maybe you don't have to see them and smell them and touch them. Maybe what you can do is help them to see and smell and touch each other and <laughs> analyze the local connections. Because it's all yeah. about people. I mean, you know, one thing, you know, civilization has done some wonderful things, but it's also screwed up a lot of humanity's best aspects. And centralization is one of those major areas where there are problems and we need to do everything we can to relocalize. So yes, you're a, as a leader, you need to play a role. And sometimes it's, it's really important that you do f connect face to face. But the other side of it is figure out all the ways you can to get all the others local connecting to each other because that can be just as powerful. Good idea. Um, there, there's another word in your intro I wanted to ask about, which was story. What does that mean here? Well, I think that just as we evolved to be connected to each other, we evolved to process stories. Human beings probably develop their brains sitting around campfires telling each other about their day's adventures, their day's hunts, there's the risks that they, they, they had. The, the sources of food in, in, in their hunter-gatherer world that they found. And stories make up who we are. They define who we are. We are our stories that we tell ourselves. And we have to rewrite some of the stories that civilization and Western culture have been putting out for us. Now, one of the most popular stories for movies is the hero's journey. You know, somebody comes along uh, leaves the ordinary world, goes on a journey, and saves the world. But it's usually some superpower, some superhero. And we need to have a new story. Uh, the, and the new story needs to be, we save the world. We do it together, a collective hero. And that can be done. 
but we have to get the people who write those stories and who produce those stories to see that that kind of a story is not only possible, it's happened. It's made some of the most important history in the world happen. You know, and, and that gets into history too, because history has totally changed as well. History used to be top-down history, generals, kings, emperors, and what have you. And when people were taught history, they were taught that history was made by those kinds of people. Uh, Howard Zinn wrote the People's History of the United States. That started a big shift. And about 30 or 40 years ago, historians started changing how they approached history as well. So that now, if you go to a university history department, there might be one or two top-down historians who look at the most powerful people. But most of the historians now look at workers and people of color and, and youth and soldiers and all these other bottom-up approaches to history. Yeah. And that really important is that the history that we teach our kids is, is, in a sense, the way that the kids see their role in history. And if they see a top-down history where only super powerful people have any effect, they don't, they, they, they don't have any idea that they can make changes happen. When you teach a bottom-up history where average people changed history and made history happen, then you give kids a sense of agency that they can make a difference. And so those are the kind of stories that we need to get out there and tell. I, I notice also in US history, of course, that not much happens in those intervening years between wars. And that in those stories of heroes using their superpowers, there are always violent superpowers. Uh, you always save the world by killing the evil beings. Uh, is that a part of storytelling uh, that we could change as well? Well, you know, it, what's, what I, I love the hero's journey. The hero's journey has some wonderful aspects to it. And it, it, the hero's journey is really also the, the story of any individual's process of becoming reborn, becoming a new person, a better person, a stronger person. Uh, so it doesn't have to be that. And, and one of the main elements of the hero's journey, the bottom-up part of the hero's journey, which I get into in the book, uh, Bottom-Up Revolution, is that once you make a decision that you are going to cross a threshold and start this new direction in your life, you, you start on a journey and you have to become reborn. And that means you have to develop new skills, new knowledge, new allies, and those are all bottom-up things, you, and they don't necessarily involve weapons. They involve developing allies, making new friends, learning new things. All of those things are part of becoming a hero, and so it doesn't have to be that way. Now, another piece of this is about power. Power is something that has radically shifted just as history has. It used to be that power was top-down power, money, weapons and force and you made people do things but that's changed now there's a new kind of power and it's a power that is called soft power the old power is hard power i consider that top down hard power the new power is soft power and it's based on attraction rather than force so you sing a song yeah you, you help build a school you help and you go help heal people who are sick. That is soft power and it attracts people and it's the way you can make huge changes happen in the world. It, it's what is, just to be clear, is what you're saying has changed our understanding and the stories we tell each other? Or are you claiming that soft power is actually a new invention? Soft power, it's, it's not new really, but it has been, it is being wielded in, in, in by many people who only thought about hard power before. I, I interviewed uh, uh, Amory Slaughter, who was the policy director for the State Department, and, and I had a very brief uh, conversation. Oh, I can't think of her name. She was the first female se Secretary of State. Um, Madeleine Albright? Madeleine Albright, yeah. I, I rode in a car with her briefly. You know, they both said that soft power is used. Uh, in, in, in diplomacy now, and soft power is, is, is a way to get people to do things that you want them to do without forcing them to do it. 
And that's a good thing. I mean, the, the way you get around war and have peace is you come up with ways to persuade people and attract them to, get, to give you what you want and, and come up with solutions. I, I'm inclined to agree with you, but not with Madeleine Albright. Uh, her definition of soft power includes uh, vicious, murderous sanctions. Uh, when she said that killing a half a million children in Iraq was worth it, whatever it may have been, that was, so, that was her idea of soft power. I knew you were, I, I knew that bringing up her name, but you know, the, the reality is even, I mean, that's hard power. Well, why is her name acceptable in our society? It's outrageous to me that she that that her name can be spoken, uh, that she can be on boards and panels and and looked to as a as a respectable authority. I mean, normally killing a half million children and not thinking twice about it would remove someone from a from a position of respect and prestige. Because even she believed that there was a place for soft power. Look. At one point, and for many people, all they think about is hard power. What I hope will happen with my book and with these kinds of conversations is people will start seeing that they're alternatives. And, you know, one of the things I came up with with Slaughter, uh, with Emory Slaughter, is that even authoritarians are going to use some of the bottom-up concepts. They're going to go out and try to do some of this stuff for their own intensive purposes, and even though they're negative purposes. But... Just the idea of using bottom-up approaches changes the way you see things. And my hope is that people, even people as bad as her, and I agree with you 100% about her, they will start thinking, well, maybe I can do it this way instead. Maybe I can take a bottom-up soft power approach instead of, of using money and force and, and, and things that kill people. And so I hope that no matter who it is, that we can start getting them to see the possibilities of bottom up. I hope so. We're speaking with Rob Cull and the book is called The Bottom Up Revolution, Mastering the Emerging World of Connectivity. Rob, you, you talk about bottom up economics, bottom up media, bottom up government, bottom up diplomacy. Can you, can you explain how, how some of these differ from what we're used to? Sure, well, top down economics, for example, is uh, let's give a billion dollars to some powerful person or organization and then trust them to spread it around. And that just doesn't work. You know, we saw that when we gave hundreds of billions of dollars to the biggest banks, they used the money to buy up more banks and to get bigger. Uh, a bottom-up approach to economics is to come up with a way so that you come up with big money, but then insist that it be distributed at a grassroots level. So one example of that that worked that I thought was great was Obama's uh, program for helping people to get cars. Uh, and basically what he did was he came up with billions of dollars and then he said, you can get $4,000 to help you buy a car, but the money is going to only go to the dealer when you buy the car. So it took an individual in, to be involved in the transaction for the money to be released. And I can see that happening with healthcare. I can see that happening, happening with local infrastructure projects. There are lots of ways that can prevent huge amounts of money to be grabbed by big organizations or individuals. And so, so you make sure that there's, an in, there's, there's a, a collective in local way of that money getting involved. And I think that is it's a simple concept really and it should be the only way that big money is spent really. There's no reason that, that a, a huge amount of money should be given to one person or one organization anymore. That should be like a dinosaur. Uh, diplomacy, you know, I was kind of talking about that already. Diplomacy, build bridges, build schools, help people heal, b make connections between sister cities. Those are all the kinds of things that can be done instead of one diplomat talking to another. And, and, and instead of having, think of it in a kind of a fractal way. You know, bottom up is, is systems chaos theory kind of based uh, thinking top down is linear atomistic thinking and so with, with with fractal you have all these different levels and you basically want to have people connected at a lot of different levels so 
diplomacy is not just diplom diplomat to diplomat, it's all the people to all the people. And, and then systems and processes to make that possible. And it's all doable, it's all being done. And, and it's different from what we're used to. Uh, it's also potentially illegal under current laws. Uh, citizen diplomacy can be, can be tricky. How do, we, how do we make it acceptable for citizens to be engaging in diplomacy on their own? Well, get the state, have the State Department say, we want you to do this and encourage, have them encourage it. Yeah. They, they... You know, one thing, if, if some billionaire goes and talks to a head of state, that's it's really still top down. But when you have the librarian in, in Podunk talking to the librarian in Botswana somewhere, that's, that's a different kind of a thing. The, yeah, well, I mean, I've gone on trips with groups of, of ordinary citizens to, to Russia and to countries that are, uh, tar you know, designated enemies of the United States and designated friends of the United States. Uh, but if on any of those trips we had actually, you know, impaired any weapon sales uh, or harmed any scheme uh, that the State Department had its, had its heart set on, uh, it, it would not have been appreciated or, or ignored by the State Department. Yeah, okay, so, <laughs> for you, do it, man. <laughs> so, it's, so we have to have a State Department that not just wants citizens involved, uh, but wants good results, uh, <laughs> that doesn't have an evil agenda. Well, that's part of the electoral process too, isn't it? I mean, from what I understood with, from Amory Slaughter, she, they, they wanted to do that. And you know, I think you're right. It depends upon the policy that's dictated from on high. But it, this is the kind of thinking that could really change things and, 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 and reduce our risk of war and, and, and increase the stability of our connections with each other. And those connections are so important. And, and the more connections we have, the better it is for us all in terms of cutting our risks of war. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it, and, the, and the concentrations of wealth in the hands of billionaires and monopolies that ought to be dinosaurs, right. ought they to be made dinosaurs by breaking them up? I've been writing since 2012 that we need to debillionaireize the planet. We need to make it illegal to become a billionaire. Uh, the easiest way to start is to do that with inheritance taxes so that no person can ever inherit a billion dollars. We need to make it so that anybody who's coming close to becoming a billionaire because of stock releases or anything like that has to make a plan ahead of time for how to distribute th that wealth to other people, hopefully employees and, and people who help to make that wealth happen. Because we have to recognize that, you know, there's, there's so much evidence that nobody becomes a billionaire by themselves. We do it as a, as a, as a whole social cloth, as a whole culture. And so we need to recognize that. And this whole crazy, bizarre idea that an individual can become ultra successful. It's a lie. And we need and say it and, and say, occupy there used to be people with signs saying that the problem is the people who think they're going to be the next billionaire so they protect the billionaires it's, it's crazy and stupid you know i've interviewed a, a good number of anthropologists and i've asked them what would an indigenous people do with somebody who tried to keep half the tribe's resources and there are three answers treat them like they're insane ban them or kill them now, I'm not saying to do any of those things, but we need to make sure that that kind of person doesn't happen and we need to prevent it from happening. And because that's another way that we get to war because these people push to make wars happen to get, get wealthier. They do indeed. You, you write that this, that this bottom-up perspective uh, reveals various top-down delusions, delusions that that lead to war and that lead to ideas of exceptionalism and, and, and so forth. What are, how are we, how are we still deluded? Well, you know, you've got so many people who, who have this idea, oh, there's a problem, somebody we don't like, bomb, bomb the 
heck out of them, drop a nuke on them. And this is insane. It's crazy. It's stupid. And, uh, but I mean, there are literally millions and millions of people who think that way. I mean, and it, it's, it, it, and I think the reason they do is it's because it's such a simple solution. Got a problem, destroy the people who are giving you the problem. Yeah. That the, the, the fact is that nuclear bombs did not win World War II. We know that. It was carpet bombing that did it, destroying city after city. And the, the, the nuclear weapons have no use or value except to the nuclear industry and, and all the people who benefit financially. And we need to start coming up with ways to solve our problems that are based on us connecting with the other people rather than disconnecting. Yeah, I saw a poll a week or so ago, a third of the people in the United States uh, would be happy to bomb North Korea, nuclear bomb North Korea, uh, even if it killed a million innocent people. Um, it, there's something, there's something wrong with a society uh, in which people are so ignorant they imagine they could safely do that and it wouldn't impact them, but also in, in which they would do that at all, isn't there? Uh, yes, of course. It's, it's insane. It's and stupid. But you know, there's a third of the American population that is just stupid and insane that, that will support all kinds of crazy things like that. And we have to change, don't we? We don't have to get every last person on board with every opinion we have, but we can't have a third of the public uh, backing mass murder, right? Of course not. You know, one thing that's hopeful for me is I wrote the book as a progressive, thinking that a bottom-up is a progressive idea, and I've gotten pushback from conservatives who say, no, bottom-up is a conservative idea. And I really like that they think that way. Great. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Maybe that it's a place that we can have some conversations. Maybe we can talk about how local is better than centralized. Maybe we can talk about the problem with too big. Now, conservatives think that, that government is too big, and, and progressives think that corporations are too big. But maybe we can come to some common grounds, and that would be a great thing. And I'm hoping that as, as I try to get my conversation out about bottom up and top down, that maybe we can find some new areas where we can find some place where we can agree. Yeah, you would think uh, localizing power, uh, stripping uh, national governments of power would be a place to agree. But as you say, it's, it's a disagreement over what kind of power, I think. I mean, I, I read through Donald Trump's objections to the House version of the Military you know, Authorization Act, uh, and it's all not enough money for this, not enough money for this, not enough money for this. Uh, and, and yet on television and in newspapers, all you'll ever hear is that the right wants less money and the left wants more money. Uh, it's really a question of money for what, isn't it? Yeah, of course. You know, and you know, the left is sick and tired of welfare for corporations and for the military. And the right doesn't want welfare for people who are poor. You know, somehow we've got to come to some terms on that. Uh, but the other side of it is that there are, there are powerful people. These, the people who benefit the most from the top-down culture that we live in, they're going to fight to the death to prevent a more bottom-up world from happening. But it's going to happen. I mean, you know, my hope is that people who read The Bottom-Up Revolution, my book, will start seeing the world with more bottom-up eyes. And they'll start seeing where there are more problems with top-down and more opportunities with bottom-up. And that they will start coming up with solutions. Because uh, Woody Guthrie and Howard Zinn both said that it's going to take a million little things to, to save the world. And I think yeah. that those little things, a lot of them are going to be bottom-up things that, that happen in, in gradual ways. And I, I love the quote from Buckminster Fuller, the way you, you change a, a system is you don't fight it head on, you replace it with something that's better. And I think that's what we need to be doing. Yeah, and, the, and 
part of what we'll, we'll be replacing is, is consumer culture, is top-down advertising what we should think and want and desire, right? How, how do we, what do we replace that with? Well, we replace it with, with being local citizens. Consumer culture is about big brands and buying things in, in box stores or from Amazon. Now, every, it, almost everybody is, is stuck having to buy stuff from Amazon, but one way you can at least modify or, or minimize the effect of Amazon is there are literally millions of small businesses on Amazon, and it's really easy to see if a product is, is being sold directly by Amazon or by a small business. And if you can, always try to do the buying from the small business. Uh, oftentimes, you can get it at the same price with the free shipping or maybe 2 or 3 or $4 more. And you should try to do that. Try to buy local and, you know, take care of each other. You know, psychiatry is another area where there's this huge top-down problem. Psychiatry has created these diagnoses that have put millions of children and adults taking psychiatric medications and other kind of medications. But we know that for most of the psychiatric diagnoses, and some of them aren't even legitimate, they're just made so that there's a drug for them. But for some of them, even the hardest ones, like schizophrenia and bi bipolar disorder and, and chronic depression, the best way to treat them is with a community, with a village, and yeah. not with a drug. And in the book, I, I, I cite Bonnie Burstow, who, who's a psychiatrist, who says that the best way to recover from a psychiatric illness is never to take the medication in the first place. And the problem is, if you're not gonna take the medication, you need to have a support network. And that's a really hard thing for people to have anymore because our communities are so fragmented and broken apart and we need to rebuild local community. And, and that is a challenge because it, is, it has been so torn apart through suburbanization and just the way that we live today. Well, hopefully we can find some combination of the internet and the real world uh, to do it, uh, to make it happen. Uh, we've been speaking with Rob Call, the book which you should run out and get and then read in a real world discussion with other people is The Bottom Up Revolution, Mastering the Emerging World of Connectivity. Uh, there, Rob's holding up the book. Uh, Rob is also, of course, the uh, founder and publisher of opednews.com, which you should check out every day and get on the email list. Rob Call, thank you very much for coming on Talk Nation Radio. Thanks. And people can check out about the book at robcall.com, R-O-B-K-A-L-L.com. Thanks, Rob.